be a bridge builder. Today, that's what we're gonna talk about is how to be a bridge builder. What is a bridge? <laughs> a bridge is a structure built to span physical obstacles for the purpose of providing passage over the obstacle, usually something that can be detrimental to cross otherwise. A bridge takes people where they need to go. You are a bridge builder, but you can't do it alone. Think about the old nursery rhyme when you're a kid, London bridges falling down. The point of that game is a partner game and people, and you hold hands and people are going under and you sing the little rhyme and then you trap the people and you go on and it's a lot of fun. Think about trying to play that game by yourself. It probably wouldn't work out very well and wouldn't be very successful. And honestly, it probably wouldn't be very fun because you need a partner, you need someone to do this. You need people and you need them to know what it is that they're doing. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, it says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. The version says it's our responsibility to equip God's people to do his work. The term equip means to cause something to be ready for its assigned purpose. It's a sign purpose. We're all assigned purpose in this life. One of our jobs as pastors and leaders is to help our volunteers and the people that we are leading to know what their purpose is. The people of God, the people that God has given us to help move our mission forward, to move God's mission forward, we need them to know what their assigned purpose is. Notice in this verse, it doesn't say that you, the pastor, need to do everything. But instead it says you equip the body of Christ to do these things. We are to equip others to do the work that they're called to do. It's our responsibility to take people from saying yes to Jesus to living a life that reflects that yes to Jesus. We're called to live more. Jesus called us to live a life of abundance, John 10.10. 10. He's come to give us life and that more abundantly. It's our job as pastors and teachers to take the people there. Our job is to build that bridge from comfortable and mediocre to abundance and fruitfulness. But how do we do that? By equipping and giving steps for them to take and it's by helping them to build that bridge. Recognizing where people are and set them up to win in the small things so they can win in the big things. What does that even look like? What does that look like to build a bridge and to equip people? Well, let's look at how Jesus did it with his disciples. You know, when Jesus came and he started calling out the disciples, he didn't just call them up and say, peace out, go do whatever you want to do and tell them about me. He took the time to train them, to equip them, to speak life into them, to live life with them, to show them what to do by his actions, to take the time to answer their questions, to talk about philosophy and, and discussion and living life. And then he sent them out. And he gave them the Holy Spirit to have the power and authority and confidence to do it all. Which, lucky for us, we have the same thing. As Jesus himself made himself to be the bridge between us and God, restoring a right relationship with God, that wasn't the only thing God wanted for us. Yes, there was a chasm and a gap because of sin and the fall of man. We're separated from God's over here, we're over here, and Jesus was the ultimate bridge maker, and now we have connection and relationship with God. That is awesome, and that is the first step, but that's not where God wants us just to stay. He wants us to live a life of service and to be equipping people so more and more people can know about his salvation, his message in the kingdom of God. God doesn't just want us to say yes to him and that's it. God wants us to live out a life of service for him and for others. One of the greatest commandments is love God and love others. He wants us to equip and be bridge builders for others. He wants us to go from good to great, from fruitless to fruitful from stuck to unstuck. As pastors and leaders, we should want the same thing for our volunteers and people we serve. We should be striving and helping our people to take their next steps in discovering and using their gifts to God and for God. When we don't do that, we are doing them and us a disservice. You know, I've been in kids ministry 
for probably close to 20 years. And it has been a long journey. And I love how God has taken me year by year and step by step and church by church and has taught me different things. And one of the first things that I've really learned was I can't do this mission alone. I can't keep doing everything and saying, I got this, I got this, I got this, because the ball's going to be dropped and people are not going to want to serve because they're like, Amy's just got it. She doesn't need help. And that's not true. I, I need help. I can't do this alone. And it is a disservice to me and to the people that I'm trying to serve and equip. If they're not allowed to use the gifts that God's called them to do and called them to use, then what am I even doing? I'm not being who God has called me to be. Jesus didn't expect the disciples to do big miracles on their very first day. He asked them to do one thing, follow me. He said, come and follow me. When we start to build our teams in kids ministry and in any ministry for that fact, when we bring people in, we need to ask them to do one thing. First and foremost, follow Jesus. Jesus came to serve. We are all called to serve. It's a non-negotiable. Do you know of anyone that isn't called to serve? I'm pretty sure I've read, you know, read the Bible. I don't think there's anywhere that says, oh, you're excused from serving. <laughs> We're all called to serve. And I like to think of serving in three layers. As, like I said, I've been in kids ministry for almost 20 years and thinking through the different types of people that we are working with and trying to understand expectations and um, Putting a label on it helps you as a leader to be better equipped to make sure that you are speaking life into them and that you aren't getting frustrated with somebody that you're put in the wrong spot. So I like to call them layers. And the first layer that I, I operate with is a volunteer. Now, what do I mean by that? I know everyone's like, well, we all have volunteers. You are right. We all have volunteers. What I mean by this is a volunteer is somebody that maybe has just said yes to Jesus for the first time, or maybe they're coming from a church and they just started 10 years because they had been overused or neglected or burned out. And they're like, I just need some time to heal. And you know what I'd really love to do? I just want to come hold babies one time a month, come in the room, hold the babies so the parents can enjoy the service and then give them back and go back. And you know what? I know that can feel awkward. You're like, is that, is that really possible? Yeah, it is. And it doesn't have to be awkward or weird. It is a good thing to have people like that in your ministry because that's where healing takes place. And as you, like I said earlier, if you can create small wins for people, then eventually they'll start to get the bigger wins and they'll start to want to own more and be a part of more. A volunteer person could look like, like I said, serving once a month. Maybe they're out buying the snacks for the early childhood class, or maybe they're helping to organize the materials and curriculum, or they're helping to email schedules, or they're taking the time to empty out all the trashes after church on a gathering. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just small, simple wins and steps to get them thinking, I know I'm called to serve and I'm called to do more. You know, when Jesus started out with his disciples, it was a matter of just loving on them and knowing who they were and getting in deeper with them. And as the disciples' faith grew, and as they started feeling the snowball effect of some winds happening, Jesus used them for bigger things. For instance, the feeding of the 5,000. I don't think that would have worked so well if it was on the very first day. He's like, come follow me and go feed these 5,000 people. They would have been like, what? But it took the time, Jesus took the time to build that relationship and that rapport with them. And so as you, as a volunteer starts to win, they will want to do more. They'll feel that draw and that pull to come in and want to lead and to lean in more and to even stretch their faith more. And what, is, what does this practically look like? This could practically look like maybe they're starting to serve. If you have multiple gatherings, they're like, you know what? I'm going to be at the nine o'clock gathering every single week. Maybe they start coming to your kids' meetings regularly, or they start recruiting and telling their friends or their family, and like, hey, you should come serve with me. You should come hang out with me and kids. It's a lot of fun. The second layer I would like to call, like, they're actually, they're leaders. They're making a change. They're taking a step forward. You know, as Jesus saw faith in the disciples grow, he released them and gave them more and more authority and ownership sending them out two by two, casting out demons, healing the sick, performing miracles. As, they, as people grow in their leadership, it's a natural step, next step, for them to own it. So this third layer I would call ownership. It's setting the pace. It's creating the culture and the environment. It's saying, I am here. This is what God has asked me to do, and I love it. This is what I'm called to do. 
They're there every Sunday. They're constantly building the team, recruiting. They're dreaming and thinking about current realities and future growth. When people see them, they see passion, they see excitement, they see happiness and joy because they're fulfilling what God has called them to do. When we give people clear lanes to serve in, they'll thrive and they'll flourish. People want to feel needed and used in a good way. They have that desire and that want. What it comes down to is you as the pastor, understanding the expectations of what you want from people is key to making this layer of leadership work. When you are expecting an ownership level from someone or people, but they really want to give a volunteer level, you're going to have a problem. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to think that person isn't gifted. And when that's not the case, Maybe it's just a shifting of your perspective, a shifting of where they need to be in their leadership. When we set people up for the wins, that's when we start to see growth. I just started at New Hope Silverdale in May, and I, I took it over from an incredible kids pastor that was right before me, and she did a great job. And I've had the opportunity over the last six months to build the team and to invest in more people. And, and one of my leaders in particular, her name is Jessica, she had just barely started serving under the last uh, kids pastor. And I talked with her and I was like, well, where do you wanna be? And she's like, I'm not really sure. So we figured out the best place for her. And I was like, can you just serve one time a month? And she's like, okay, I can do that. At the time, we were only doing one gathering at 10 a.m., so asking somebody to serve one time a month was a lot because then they wouldn't get a gathering. So she started serving, and she brought her teenage daughter with her. And they're like, we really like this. This is a lot of fun. A month ago, we launched two gatherings, and I'm talking with Jessica and her daughter, Jasmine, and they, I'm asking them, like, how are you liking things? What, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? And she's like, I really love this. And, you know, with us going to two gatherings, you know, you probably need me to serve for one of the gatherings every single week, don't you? And I looked at her and inside I'm like, yes, yes, yes. But I kept it cool because I don't want to scare anyone off. And I was like, you know, that would be awesome if you could do that. I think that'd be incredible if you could own the 1030 gathering in early childhood every week, if you would come and serve and be an assistant teacher. And she's like, yeah, I can do that. She was somebody who was on the fringe who got pulled into just a volunteer level of like, I can do one time a month. Through those little wins and that subtle community building, now she is at a leader level. She is there every single week. And not only is it her, she is bringing her daughter. And they are both making sure they get up on time and they come to church because they're like, we gotta go teach that class. We gotta go hang out with those kids. I love serving. I love being a part of this. What it took was for me as the pastor to change my perspective and to make sure my expectations were on point and to help build that bridge from Jessica saying yes to Jesus and not just staying there, but helping her to cross that bridge into being everything that God is wanting her to be and to do what God is wanting her to do. When we equip people, we build a bridge for them to cross over into new territory and victory in their life. We help them to go where Jesus wants them to go. People want clear, easy on-ramps to serving and doing what God has called them to do. Volunteer, leader, and owner. Equip your team to be where God wants them to be and be the bridge builder.